Hello! Hey, everybody! Man, I'm really washed out. Let's see if I can stand somewhere where you can see me instead of me looking like Casper. How about that? Can you see me now? Hey! Hello, everybody! Hello, hello, hello! All right, welcome to Ask Wit Wednesday. And I have like 10 questions to get through. And look, there's husband. You see his feet? You see his feet? <laughs> So he's here. He may chime in also on some of the answers to these questions. Um, if you have any other questions, you can put them here. And if I have time towards the end, I'll go through the questions that you have right now. Um, but it might be best for you to put it in the event for Ask Wit Wednesday next week. All right. Um, so, all right. Questions today are about comps, about group coaching, about how to get uh, leads with if you don't have any time, where to find the YouTube videos, who is Jason and what is he doing in here? Um, what's a lease option? How do we get mailbox money? How do I get out of my comfort zone? Can you do a lease option on a duplex? And how do we analyze a property? All right. So we have a lot to go through today. And some of these questions I'm going to let Jason answer. Um, but let's cover comps first because comps were the first question that I had. What are comps? How do we find comps? What do we do with comps? What is a comp, all right? So a comp is a comparable sale. In residential real estate, we if you're looking at a subdivision and you're trying to buy one house and three other houses have sold in that subdivision in the last six months to a year, then those houses are comps, they're comparable sales to your house. Now, if you have a house that's out in the country and you're not in a subdivision, everything doesn't look the same, then the comps may be a little bit harder to come by, but you can find comps on the big Z. Now, I would not use the Zestimate uh, and I would not use the comparable sales as 100% fact because what happens on the big Z, as an agent if, or as a homeowner, when I put my house up for sale, let's say I'm selling it for 150000 if I actually get an offer for 140 but I accept 130 and we close at 130 then uh, the big Z is going to ask me, how much the house sold for. And if I'm an agent, it's in my best interest to rank higher on Zillow that if I listed it for 150, that I sold it for 150. So it's a blank. I can fill it in. I can say I sold it for 150, which is exactly what I listed it for and rock and roll on about my life. I can put in that I accepted uh, 140 and rock and roll with that throughout my life, or I can tell the closing price, what we actually collected, of 130. All right, so depending on the people and who's answering the question, that's gonna make your comps fluctuate. All right, uh, the big Z is good enough that if you wanted to just kind of guesstimate, just kind of get in the ballpark, it, it'll let you know that the house is somewhere between 130 and 160. All right, but it won't tell you that it's definitely worth 138. If you need a hard and fast comp, you need ARV, you're gonna have to ask an agent to pull comps for you because agents have access um, to what the house is actually sold for, not what the listing agent claims it sold for on Zillow. Uh, you can also go to your county's GIS to find comps. And this will take a while because you're going to have to find everything that sold in and around this neighborhood in the last 6 to 12 months or in and around this house or something. And in comps, you can stress yourself out of your mind trying to say, okay, well, that house had three bedrooms, two baths. My house has four bedrooms, two baths. So there's a little bit of difference here. And you can go crazy trying to calculate exactly what that difference is for the extra bedroom. Or you can say it's within five or ten thousand. Okay, you can also drive yourself crazy saying, "Well, that house had fancier granite than my house, and that house had granite in the bathrooms, and my house still has the uh, other stuff." Formica. Formica in the bathrooms. Okay, you can drive yourself crazy, but if you'll come close within two, three, four, five thousand dollars, that should be good enough to rock and roll and get on to the next step, okay? Because you can always renegotiate. You can always come back and renegotiate if you completely failed to 
uh, calculate your comps. And Jason thinks it's hilarious to see me do math and figure out comps because math is just not one of my strong suits. Are you wanting to be on the video? Because we see your elbow. No, I'm good. Okay. So let me ask you a real you're, quick question. You're good, except now you want to talk. So you Husbands. talked about an agent Husbands. lying and putting something out there. That I didn't say true. they lied. Uh, if you sold it for one thing and you put it out there another, that's a lot. That's we can it. call it a lot of different things, but it's a lot. It's if you lot. listed it at one amount and sold it at another, it's a lot. So here's a question. As an agent and as a broker, if you did that, could you lose your license because of that? I have no idea. Okay, just ask me. Just, just curious. I have no idea, but we're not spitballing questions. We've got a ton of questions to go through. Okay. Don't add more to the list. Okay. okay, so back to comps. Comps are comparable sales, and that's what we use to decide a house a house is worth based on what everything else has been selling for. Are you done being on video, or are you going to? No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, back to me then. Okay, so though that's comps. And you can get comps from the Big Z. You can use your county's GIS, Geological Information Service, to get comps. You can have an agent friend or cousin of yours pull comps on this specific house. Uh, you can hire an agent that just pulls comps for you. Uh, what are some other ways that you can find comps? I like Property Shark because they use both uh, information from, uh, you know, agents that they put out there and stuff. Uh, which, you know, if you use Redfin, Truly, or Zillow, you're probably going to get the same information because those are all collectively pulled from the same place. Uh, Property Shark, though, uh, in addition to that, also does supplement with uh, county records and stuff. Now, there can be a delay, so if it's a really recent sale. But uh, to be honest with you, I find that between Property Shark, Truly, or Zillow, Redfin, all the free stuff, um, those are pretty good. I told somebody yesterday, uh, you know, a lot of people talked about Hanes and should I pay for that type of product? Personally, for me, not. Uh, if you want to look at a pay site, uh, real, uh, I think it's Real Quest, maybe. Real uh, eFlow. Uh, no, Real Quest is the one that I like. But anyway, uh, I personally don't pay for data because I don't really think that you need to. The um, thing is, we just have to be in the ballpark here. The ballpark will get you close enough. Exactly. I don't want you making offers down to the penny and freaking out if you outbid a dime. Get it under contract. Get close. Get within two, three, four, five thousand. All right. Get close. Close enough is good enough for now. Okay. Especially when you're pulling comps. Should take you. You should get down to where you can do it in five or ten minutes. Not a huge deal. If you have any other questions about comps? Send them to me. Okay. Next question is on group coaching. Group coaching is closed right now. It is closed right now. I do not know when we're going to open it back up. As soon as I do know, as soon as we decide when we're going to open up group coaching, um, we will let you know. We will let you know a hundred million different times so that you are fully prepared next time we open up group coaching. And I, I keep saying we on the group coaching. Y'all catching that? Okay. Next question is... Whitney, I don't have any time. I have a job. I have a kid. I have a husband or I don't have a husband. I have church. I have a mom that needs me. I have a hobby. I have a license. I don't have a license. I'm trying to do all these different things and make dinner and stay sane. So what is going to be my best marketing method because I can't get out there and create a whole lot of massive action. I just don't have time. All right. This was the question that was presented to me. And I want to tell you, if you don't have a lot of time, I really want you to look, and this is going to hurt a little bit. I want you to look at what you're spending your time on. Are you watching Game of Thrones? Are you binge watching Netflix? Are you on Facebook and, you know, hanging out and watching tons of videos and cat videos and uh, all sorts of other stuff? Do you spend 30 minutes a day in the morning while you're getting ready watching the news and then 30 minutes every night when you get home watching the news? Like, what are you doing in 24 hours? I know you have a job. 
I, I know you're trying to keep up with, you know, everything I put out there. And I know that you're trying to, you know, be a good mom or be a good husband and all these things. I understand that. And I hear this all the time, you know, but, but Whitney, I just need to relax. I watch the news to relax. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. But somebody out there isn't relaxing. Somebody out there isn't watching the news for an hour every day. Somebody out there is canceling their TV. They're blocking their Facebook. They're posting on Craigslist twice as much as you are. They're putting out more bandit signs than you are. Somebody out there is outworking you. You have enough time to do this, okay? One thing that I think people kind of forget or maybe I don't say enough is that when I started buying houses, I had four jobs. I had four jobs, all trucking jobs, all trucking related, okay? I was working my tail off 26 hours a week and then I had a boyfriend in Atlanta who had two kids in travel ball. So my weekends were shot. I was spending six to eight hours a week in the car. That's a full day that I was spending in the car. I was working for the rest of the week. I had four jobs and I still found time to go buy houses. I still found time to send out yellow letters. I still found time to do things that were gonna get me into seller's houses. I quit going out to dinner with my girlfriends because I was wasting two or three hours a week when I could have been looking at two or three different houses. And let me chime in on this too, cause I, you know, I've always had a corporate job and, um, and um, found time to do it. A good time for me was, uh, you know, I would go eat lunch every day and, you know, I didn't work a standard punch a clock. I had a lot of flexibility. You know, we might go out for an hour and a half lunch. It might be a two hour lunch, whatever. Wasting a lot of time doing that. I mean, I enjoyed the camaraderie with some of my peers and teammates and stuff like that. But I found that, you know, midday and my lunchtime was a good place for me to do a little bit of research or order my uh, Melissa data list or, or whatever the case may be. And, you know, I hear a lot of people say, well, but Jason, you know, you guys have kind of got your stuff on autopilot. That That's easy for you to say. Uh, first of all, it's, it's truly not on autopilot. Uh, many pieces of it are. But the second thing is, it's taken a long time to get to where we are today. I mean, you know, people talk about, well, should I go hire a VA? Okay. You can hire a VA, but I'm telling you right now, you're going to have to train them. If you want the same success and conversion rates, you have to train them. A script is good but they have to know the levels of enthusiasm and they have to know trigger points and they have to know all of these other things that you're not going to be able to teach them if you haven't done it yourself. So, you know, you're going to have to take some time to learn this. And then once you've kind of got it down pat, you know, then you can begin to hire a VA and you can kind of have them shadow you. They can hear your conversations. They can tell, uh, you know, which way they need to go to, to lead the conversations and things like that. But, you know, this is not a business where uh, I can just go hire a VA and they're going to want it, you know, they're going to do it from day one uh, the way that, that I want it to be done and the way that it needs to be done. You're going to have to put in the time there. And like Whitney said, she's not going to sugarcoat it. So I'm not either. Uh, if you say you don't have the time, um, you probably shouldn't get into it. Uh, you're probably not going to be uh, very successful and which is going to lead to frustration um, and, and there's really no other way around that. And one of the things is when I get on these calls with people before I let them into my group or let them into my one-on-one -on -one program, I make sure, hey, this is going to take like 10 to 15 hours a week. Do you have 10 to 15 hours you can give me and give your sellers for the next 12 weeks to make sure this is going to happen? And people tell me yes. And then two weeks later, they're like, oh, but I don't have the time. Well, you told me you could find 10 to 15 hours a week. All right. It's going to take at least 10 to 15 hours a week. I'm sorry, but it is. It takes work. It's not. In the beginning. Yeah, in the beginning it is. Now, right. 
we can, we've got it rolling to where we can go out and do it. But in the beginning, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some time. So three things that you can do. We really need some blinds. Look how washed out we look. Hey, <laughs> three things that you can do uh, fast, down, and dirty is y'all are on Facebook. We're doing a seven-day free Facebook lead challenge next week. I've given you two homework assignments so far. I'm going to give you a third homework assignment tomorrow. You need to do your homework so that next week when we get into our lead challenge, it just pops off and we can start getting those leads coming in. Okay? This is a free lead challenge that we're going to do here in the group next week. So get your homework. Get it going. Get the pictures that I tell you you're going to need because you're going to use them next week. All right. Second thing that you can do, if you want to, if you want to spend some time and energy and money, you can send out yellow letters. You can just get a list. Jason uh, mentioned Melissa data earlier. You can get a list of addresses. You can send out letters. You can take calls and then go see sellers. That's a really good thing to do. Uh, I did a video for the rock stars earlier this morning on small business expos also, because that's one of the things that I did when I got started. The county that I was in was having a small business expo where they needed vendors, they needed people. And think, if your county doesn't have a small business expo, they've got a strawberry festival or a tomato festival or a homecoming festival or whatever, and they're looking for vendors. They're looking for people who will say, here's a hundred bucks. Let me talk to the people that you're going to have at this thing. And from that weekend that I, I donated a whole weekend of my life, okay, and I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to tell people I buy houses. I filled out probably 100 lead sheets that week. Half of them were crap, but I filled them out because I needed to practice filling out my lead sheet. I needed to practice giving my one-liner. I needed to practice finding, listening, detecting, motivated sellers. So I did that, and you can do that too, all right? Do a small business expo. You will get leads. I got three houses out of that. I bought three houses from one weekend worth of work. So if you don't have a lot of time, maybe you can send the kids to grandma's or send them to um, your ex-wife or your ex-husband's. And instead of using that time to veg out and go on a girl's trip, maybe you ask a girlfriend to come help you man a booth and get leads. That's a great way to use a weekend is to donate it, immerse yourself, get some leads, get in there, get like down and dirty in the you know trenches and get some leads coming in. What? Next topic. Okay. Uh, no time, best marking. Okay, so let's talk about Jason. Ta-da! Hey y'all, this is my husband, Jason. And he is helping me now. Um, we are going to start doing the group coaching calls together. He is going to be presenting on apartments because I'm the house person in the house. And he is the multifamily person in the house. So he is going to start helping me on the weekly group calls for houses. But he's also going to start doing what? Monthly? Monthly, Thanks. maybe weekly calls on apartments and multifamily, um, apartments, trailer parks, uh, anything that lots of people are living in and under, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes. He is doing a special presentation tomorrow at 8 on that, uh, on, you know, the difference in multifamily and single family, how to find them, how to compare them, what the deal is on those. And you're going to see a lot more of him. You've been seeing he's doing a uh, button challenge right now. Uh, 10 days, he's wearing his button, he's reporting in every day so that you can see progress and what it's like and that, yes, some days you get a lot of leads and some days you don't. Some days you forget your button. <laughs> so he is doing that. He is helping me and he has been wonderful to help me with all that too. If you have any questions um, about houses or apartments, you can direct them at him or he and I, one, will get back to you and answer those questions. So you want to say hello? Introduce yourself. Hello. I did a pretty good job. Yeah, you did pretty good. And this has been a long time coming. I mean, this is something she's wanted me to do, you know, for a long time. Uh, and, um, you know, now the time is right. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. So uh, for everybody out there that has talked about, you know, when I first got started, 
people ask me all kinds of questions. I, and, and I threw out answers. Everybody wants passive income. If you didn't, I don't think you'd even be considering investing in real estate. Um, you know, everybody also, I said financial freedom. I'm not sure I really understood what that meant. I'm, I'm not so sure that I still understand that, but you know, financially we are at a place where I, I can now do that. And a lot of that is simply because of what we've done over, uh, you know, past years with real estate to help set ourselves up to this point. Um, and so, you know, we've, uh, we, we've been there for a while, but I still wasn't able to pull the trigger. And um, so we decided about two or three weeks ago that now's the time. And uh, so I can tell you this, I had about an hour and a half to two hour commute every morning uh, when I did drive into my office. So I'm definitely not missing having to do that. And then the, the afternoons and evenings were even worse. So um, yeah, 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 you know, so in terms of obtaining your goals and stuff like that, we just keep checking them off the list. And uh, you know, this, this is a big one for me because I've always had a, you know, steady corporate job. And uh, so to now kind of shed that is very exciting. And it's, uh, you know, something else that uh, we just move on to the next one on the list. So that's what I was going to say. Uh, we check off our goals and then I add what? Five more to the list. <laughs> so uh, go bigger. Keep going. I do not let us get comfortable. Do I? That's right. <laughs> okay. Next question. What is a lease option? Somebody asked me that uh, in the group the other day. What is a lease option? Well, quickly, a lease option is a really fancy rental agreement between you and a seller that says that you have the option to purchase the property at a certain price at a certain point in the future. And in the meantime, before you close on that, you close them out, cash them out, you are going to lease the house and make payments every single month, okay? So it's a fancy rental agreement that says you're gonna be renting the house every month for the next five to 10 years. And if at any point in that time or at that time, you can buy the house for a price we agreed upon now, all right? That's a lease option. You can call it a rent to own. Uh, some people call it uh, owner financing or seller financing. It, it, it's a little bit different than that. Um, owner financing or seller financing is on a free and clear house. I like to say that a lease option is a Band-Aid. It'll go on a free and clear house that you're going to make pay payments on and buy in a little while. Uh, it'll also go on a house with a mortgage. So if you're going to be taking on somebody's mortgage, you can do a lease option on it. You don't have to do a subject to deal. In subject to, title transfers to you. In a lease option, it doesn't. But we protect ourselves by filing the lease option with the county, either the clerk and master or the registrar of deeds or the property tax assessor or whatever your county calls it, we record that with your county so that we are a lien holder on the property so that we don't have somebody goes around back behind us and sells it while we're still in the middle of it. All right, so that that's a lease option. Um, and I talk a ton about lease options in our course. The way I explain it to people all the time, it's like, you know, you, you date and then you get in a committed relationship, right? It, to me, it's like being in a committed relationship. You have the option to marry and buy the person or, you know, and you don't know, you don't have to exercise it or you can't. And that, you know, so, but, you know, everybody knows when you're in a committed relationship, you're still making payments. It's still expensive, all that kind of stuff, right? Hey, that's good. Every time I tell that story, people are like, oh, yeah, it clicks now. Don't judge me. <laughs> he could have bought a house for anyway. less than what he paid for me. I'm telling you that. <laughs> anyway. You don't own me. Next. <laughs> All right. Next question is, would you recommend doing a lease option in a state with high property taxes? I, I recommend doing a lease option anywhere and everywhere that you can. In Texas, you can't do a lease option. You have to do subject to in a wrap. Um, but would I recommend doing it in a state with high property taxes? All you have to do is figure in the property taxes in your monthly payment. And if everybody in the state is paying high property taxes, then it's not that weird. Like, if I go to a different county in Tennessee and they've got, uh, you know, an extra gas tax, 
Maybe that just means I buy gas in the other county. But if everybody in Tennessee is paying a high property tax, then everybody is used to it. All right? Whatever works, whatever people are used to, whatever, oh, hold on, Florence. Whatever you have going on that's regular and normal in your market, then it's regular and normal. I wouldn't say that it's just going to be impossible just because you have high property taxes. You have to figure that into your monthly rent. And as long as you can have the mortgage paid, you can have the taxes paid, and you can make a little bit of money, there's plenty of landlords still renting properties in states with high taxes. You want to buy in your area? Then buy in your area. You'll find tenants, you'll find tenant buyers, you'll find sellers. Maybe not in California because people are crazy out there. Uh, and I want to clarify, Florence made a really good point. In Texas, if a house has a mortgage on it, you can't do a lease option to buy that house. You have to take the property subject to and put a wraparound mortgage on it. If you own a house free and clear in Texas, you can lease option that house out because it is your house. What you can't do in Texas is lease option somebody else's house and then sell it on a lease option. You can't do a sandwich lease option in Texas. If you own a house free and clear, or I don't know, maybe if you have a house with a mortgage on it and you decide to do a lease option, you might be able to do that in Texas, but you can't do a sandwich lease option in Texas. I feel like a cheerleader or an air flight controller. You're getting too into terms here. It, it's it's all basically the same thing. It comes down to what the paperwork says. So you know the strategy and stuff is is still the same. Some uh, some states don't allow you to call it a lease option. It's uh, what all inclusive deed of trust. And yeah, AI, and DTV technically in Tennessee, and it's a land like contract. So, it's um, not a. So don't get too hung up on terminology right now. Um, the the methods and strategy and stuff are, are basically the same. You just, it's just what you call it and what the paperwork has to say. Mailbox money. Let's talk about mailbox money. So how do we create mailbox money? Is that mail run today? Speaking of? I don't know. We got inbox money instead of mailbox money. Oh, yes. It's even better because <laughs> you don't have to walk to the mailbox <laughs> and get it. Uh, so mailbox money, landlords get mailbox money. In the old days, when my mom started investing, she would buy a house, put a renter in it, and they would mail her a rent check every month, and she'd walk to the mailbox, get the check out, take it to the bank, and deposit it. She had money in her mailbox. It's mailbox money. Now, my mama still does that, but I don't do that. <laughs> okay? My mama loves her mailbox money, but my mama is a different generation than I am, and I don't know if I'm lazier than she is or if I'm smarter than she is. But I don't do mailbox money. Do not send me a check. I am not coming by to collect cash. You better take that money and put it in my bank or have your bank send it to my bank. Somehow or another, I'm not collecting rent. It is auto done, and I get an email in my inbox that says, congratulations, Whitney, you have money. So mailbox money, inbox money, depends on what you want to do. I have tenants that have cash jobs. They get cash. They wanted to know if they could give me cash every month. No, I don't have time to come meet you and get my money. You need to take that to my bank and put it in my account. Inbox money, auto, direct deposited, ACH, that's what we get these days. Inbox money, not mailbox money. So, Wit, how do I get out of my comfort zone? All right, this one's fun. I put up a picture the other day, and it was somebody, and they're in their comfort zone, and they finally get up the nerve, and they run, and they push the button, and then they run back to their comfort zone. Whew, I did it. 
And I think that's what, that's how I imagine some of you look when you're going on seller appointments. You're like in your car and you're like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. And, and maybe you're driving for dollars and maybe you're looking for empty houses and I don't know what you're doing. Or maybe you're even at a seller's house, but you go, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. And you get out of your car and you walk up and you ring the doorbell and nobody answers and you run back and get in your car and you leave. I did it. I went to the seller's house. They weren't home. You kind of did it, all right? I want you to have some conversations. I want you to put some offers out there. I want you to start negotiating. I want you to actually get an appointment to talk to the sellers when you know they're going to be home so that you can get a contract. People tell me all the time they want to buy houses, but they don't want to get contracts signed. Does that make sense to you? It does, and I'll tell you something that I did because you know I started off in houses just like Whitney, uh, and then decided you know that I wanted to do apartments. And you know one of the things I'm going to talk about tomorrow is you know the difference, some fundamental differences with characteristics and stuff between single family and apartments. But the lingo and what you have to speak is also different. And and until I got into it and really got accustomed to it, one of my fears was, well, what if I go talk to somebody and it's a good deal? And I miss out on that opportunity because they're like, either he's not a savvy investor, he doesn't understand, or they think I'm a dumbass, or you know, whatever the case may be. So to be honest with you, what I did is I looked up properties in places that I knew I wasn't going to invest. And I just picked up the phone and I started calling people and I just started having conversations. And the more I realized was two things. Number one, I really wasn't that far behind on my lingo. As a matter of fact, I talked to some people right off the bat that I think I knew more than they did, and they were commercial brokers and, and, and represent properties. But you know, the, the best thing to do is start having the conversations, and it doesn't matter who you're having them with. If, if you have the same fear that I did, well, you know, I don't want to do it with people in my area because I might run into them at church if you live in a small town, or you know, it might hurt my reputation around the area or, or whatever. Don't do it in the area. And nobody says that you have to make an absolute definitive offer on the first phone call that you're on. Just call and start having conversations with people that have stuff listed, with agents that have stuff listed, whatever the case may be. As long as you're talking about real estate, I promise you, you will learn something each and every single conversation. Uh, and it won't take long, guys. It really won't take long. I did that for probably, what, six weeks maybe uh, until finally... Uh, you know, we just said to heck with it and, uh, you know, went and saw a property, put in an LOI and, and the rest is history. So um, just start having the conversations. There, there's no other way around that. One thing I want to bring up, too, is that was kind of uncomfortable to call the, all those people, right? Sure. Okay, big deal. You survived, right? I did. You learned a lot, right? I did. Awesome. And you just figured out parts of your day where you could just slide that in. Or get back to them at a certain time. You just have to put it into your rhythm. Okay? That's how you're going to find the good deals. You keep at it. Keep at it. Keep at it. And you will find some people out there that don't really want to talk to you. I mean, I called on a couple of them and the broker was like, well, unless you can send me a letter confirming that you have enough for closing, then we can't really have this conversation. And you know, my point was, hey, you know, screw you out. And I went on to the next one, right? Because for every person that's not willing to help you and they want to put up walls and roadblocks and they want to think you're not good enough, there's somebody out there that actually needs your help, wants your help, and it'll be a mutually beneficial conversation. So don't, you know, if you have somebody try to shut you down originally, don't get upset because it's not worth it. Uh, you know, second of all, don't let it stop you. I mean, a lot of people you know, start down a journey and because they don't have immediate success, they just stop, you know, and if that happens to you, you got to readjust your mindset and realize that everybody goes through that. There's not a single person that invests in real estate that, you know, every time they've actually encountered somebody about a property, they've actually bought it and not had any problems or issues or roadblocks. It, it just, it doesn't happen. And those things are going to be there. So just don't, don't, don't let that deter, uh, you know, you from, from moving forward. The best way to get out of your comfort zone is to get used to being uncomfortable. I hate that. I know it's cliched. I know it sounds, you know, crazy or whatever. But if you can get out there and be uncomfortable, if you can take 30 minutes of insane courage, 
It'll be easier tomorrow. If you can take 30 seconds of insane, brave courage, you know, if you can be the person your dog thinks you can be for 30 minutes a day, it's amazing what all will start to come to you, what all will start to flow into you just naturally that you don't have to go out there and stress and strain to find. All right, so get uncomfortable. That's how you get out of your comfort zone. Do something that seems outrageous, and then the next time you do it, it won't be that weird. Okay, somebody asked me this question, and I thought it was an awesome question. Can you do a lease option on a duplex? And initially, I said no. But what I want to say is that if you have a duplex, you cannot lease option one side of it. You could do a lease option for the whole unit. You could do a, what's called a master lease option, yes. But like we have a triplex in Morristown, Tennessee. A lease option says that I am selling you this house, you're gonna make these monthly payments, and in a certain amount of time, you're gonna buy it. Well, we don't want that to happen on our triplex, we just want regular renters in our triplex. So originally, I'm gonna say no. But if you're looking to buy a duplex or a triplex or a quadplex or a 10 unit or whatever, you can put a master lease option on that property so that instead of those tenants sending the seller their money every month, they send it to you and you send a payment to the seller. You can do a master lease option like that. If you're in, if you're living in a duplex or a triplex or a quadplex or something right now, you can call your landlord and say, hey man, would you think about selling me this thing? And they might say yes. And then when you pay your rent, you would also collect rent from your plex mates and you could be buying the property. So I originally said no, but now I'm saying yes. But you don't want to, if you're owning it, you can't, like we could not lease option three units in our triplex because then we'd have three different people trying to buy it. So no, you can't do that. All right. That's right. And a good tip out there, I mean, it, you know, we talked about duplexes and triplexes and stuff like that. Um, you know, I generally sometimes shy away from them because they're smaller and things like that, you know, may not get the same return. But uh, with that being said, per unit, the one that we have produces better than anything else we have. If anybody's out there and your kid is about to go off to college and you're worried about student housing or they don't want to live in the dorm, they want to live. I'm telling you, if you can find a triplex that you can buy and stick them in one of the units, rent the other two units out to college students or heck, it can even be, you know, not college students or whatever. In all likelihood, the rent from those other two units will cover your kid to live there basically for free. Um, and, and, you know, not only that, you'll be paying down on the principal every month. So you'll be gaining um, an asset, you know, so I, I encourage people all the time. I said, you know, uh, if I'd known what I know now, when my kids were born, uh, I would have bought them, uh, a, a house. I, I tell a story all the time. I'm, a, I'm an outdoorsman. Uh, I think it's pretty cool that, you know, you can have stuff and, and memories that trigger certain things. So, uh, when, when my kids were born, the day they were born, I went out and bought a shotgun. And, you know, when they get to a certain age that they're responsible enough to have that, it's a gift to them. And it says, hey, I've been holding this thing since the day you were born. You know, so for the rest of their life, they'll be like, hey, you know, I got this and my dad bought it the day it was born. But that's not really going to do anything. It may provide some some uh, opportunities with them if, if they're into, you know, hunting and stuff like that. What if I bought them a house, though? And I said, hey, I bought this the day you were born. And that's a gift to you, right? You're leaving high school. You can live in it. You can rent it out for extra income. You can sell it and go on a trip, whatever you want to do. But I gave you an asset, uh, and, and I bought this day you want. I, to me, I think that's a, a pretty awesome thing, uh, and, and I, I wish, wish I'd have known back then what I know now. And one thing that I want to point out on that story is if the shotguns, I don't know, I wasn't there. If they were 1000 or 1500 bucks, you could have given that 1000 or 1500 bucks to a, a seller. You could have had somebody else living in the house. So you would have had the same money invested in a gun as you did in a house. And then you would have been able to give them a house that was cash flowing and probably paid off in 18 years. Then I don't want to say a trinket, but you know, 
not a house. It's kind of funny. We, you know, we, we've been talking about that for a while. It, it, it occurred to me at an auction. We had a lady show up, and you know, she was one of the neighbors, and she had a kid with her. And so the auctioneer knew her, and he said something about her. He said, well, uh, surprised you're here. Y'all been today? She goes, no, I would have absolutely no use for a house. And so I looked at her, I said, other than to buy it for him, for his future, right? And it just kind of clicked. And so since then, I've told that story, uh, you know, numerous times, you know, when I've been speaking or, or other things that I've done. And uh, I've actually had some people text me back or email me back and say, hey, I, I, I did it. And I'm like, you did what? They're like, I, I bought a house for my kid, you know, and by the time they graduate, you know, it's going to be free and clear. And I'm like, that's awesome. And I'm kind of jealous. And I'm like, great, I'm telling other people something I should have done myself. So. We're on our way Whatever. now. It's okay. We'll have it done by the time they graduate. <laughs> All right. Uh, the last question that we have is how do we analyze properties? Woo, baby. We could go on this one all day long, couldn't we? We, we, we could, uh, but we would eventually get to, what do we call it? Analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis. And if I would say that that's something that, uh, you know, we talked about getting out of your comfort zone and we talked about overcoming some of your fears. Once you've done all that stuff and you're on the right track, I would say the single biggest roadblock that people uh, get to is they start suffering from analysis paralysis. And what does that mean? It basically means that you are overanalyzing every single step and to the point where you're going to talk yourself out of it. You know, everybody's thinking that that first deal has to be the perfect deal, you know, and, and if that's the case, you, you may or may not ever talk yourself into it. Now, now I'm not saying you should go and not analyze something and it be a bad investment because, you know, hey, those have been out there. Whitney and I have been involved in some stuff that, you know, uh, ended up costing us money. And, and that's just, you know, that's that's the risk re reward of, of investing in real estate, just as it is putting your money in a stock market. But, um, you know, uh, don't sit there and just stress over, um, you know, looking at the property and, and, and trying to second guess what the ARB is and, uh, you know, going through the monthly income and, and things like that. Because if you do, uh, you'll never buy a property. You'll always continue uh, to overanalyze. And uh, that, that's just not something that you want to do. There's so many steps to buying a house, and it's basically two big steps. You buy a house and you sell it, right? That That's the biggest thing that we get to. But there's lots of little steps and lots of little things that we do in the meantime, and it's easy to get analysis paralysis on every single step. I mean, you could spend two weeks getting repair estimates on a house, and the seller would sell it in those two weeks. While you were busy doing your research, they got it done. All right, so I would encourage you to do some homework up front, get some guesstimates, get some figures in place, make some offers, sign some contracts, get some deals done, and then go back and renegotiate if you need to. Yeah, the other thing too is, uh, you know, it, it's not as simple as just doing the analysis. You really have to already know, uh, you know, what my strategy is. And your strategy usually boils down to, and I'm gonna cover this a little bit on the webinar that I'm doing tomorrow night with multifamily and stuff, it's usually either a buy and hold situation, meaning I'm going to buy it, uh, you know, I'm, I, unless it's just a pretty house, which, you know, normally a lot of times those go to retail buyers and, and stuff like that. Yeah, but it may be something that I have to buy it. I may have to put some money in and then I'm going to hold it and I'm going to rent it out and I may keep it forever. I may pass it on to the next generation or I may have plans to sell it sometime in the future, eight to 10 years from now, right? That, that's one strategy. The others, I boil everything into what I call value play. That would cover fix and flips, uh, you know, wholesale, whatever you want to do, you're looking to do it quickly, and you're, in a lot of cases, looking to get uh, a, a one-time payment or a one-time benefit from that, right? Um, and I think the biggest thing that people, uh, that, that I would encourage you, in, and I, I don't want to confuse you, but you do need to learn tax strategies and, and what are the tax oh, consequences on that? You know, a lot of people that I talk to, especially the people that come to us for like one-on-one -on -one coaching, they get so excited and they're doing this and they go on and I, I say, okay, that's great. And they're like, I'm going to make $50,000. And I was like, you are? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, well, how do you feel about giving 30% of that to Uncle Sam? And they're like, do what? I'm like, yeah, if you actually take title to this property and you make 50 grand on it, 
and you go ahead and sell it, then and less you've than held year. it less than a year, you're going to pay short-term capital gains on that. You know, and so people are like, and that's when the lease option strategy comes in where you can hold it for more than a year and have a good qualified tenant buyer in it who's going to do improvements and not destroy it. So again, I, you know, I don't want to deter anybody or get, or get too in depth, but you know, the, the question is a, is a, is a good question. Uh, but, but when we're answering this question about how do I analyze it, we really need to focus on what type of deal are we going to put in place? Because I can't really answer that question uh, until I know that. You know, I, I would approach uh, an analysis on a fix and flip uh, separately than I would a wholesale deal, and a wholesale deal much le uh, different than I would a traditional owner financing deal, and an owner financing deal different than I would analyze something that I'm going to do a wrap or a lease option on. Or private uh, money or any of that other stuff. Yeah, that, yeah, how do you analyze a deal? I don't know. How are you going to do your hair in the morning? I need to know more. <laughs> um, if I had one thing that I would focus on, for me, it's about my return on my investment. So how much am I going to get back on what I put into the deal? A lot of people will tell you, well, you need to look at the overall ROI of the deal and things like that. Not if I'm not using my own money, I don't. Another thing you need to look at is we need to look at your situation. Where are you? What are you needing to do? There may be some things in your life or there may be some things in your seller's life or in your buyer's life that we need to look at and we need to know what kind of moving parts. It's kind of like playing Connect Four. We need to know what to do to get to the end to win, but there's lots of different things that could come up in the meantime. So just to say, how do we analyze a property? I would start, if you want to answer, you want to analyze a property, I would start with really getting good at figuring out comps. And R. And R. And uh, having some repair cost estimates like in your pocket that you can move some things around on the calculator if that's what you want to do or you can go out you can start looking at a lot of houses and you can start analyzing houses to say you know what repairs what is this what is that what is it I mean there's a it's a whole day's topic on how to analyze a deal how to analyze a property so if you have a question that like maybe is the subtopic of how to analyze a deal let's talk about that instead of how to just analyze a deal. All right, if you have any other questions, submit them to the Ask Wit Wednesday in the Become a Real Estate Rockstar with Whitney Nicely. Um, there's a event, a, an event invitation every week, and if you'll put your questions in there, that way we'll know which questions we're gonna answer, and they'll all be in there. Everybody can see what questions we're gonna be answering. Uh, we will do Ask Wit Wednesday on Wednesdays at 1, and this will be your time to talk to us to answer any kind of questions that you have. If you are watching this on a YouTube replay or if you found me on YouTube and you want to come into the group, go to WhitneyNicely.com slash group, answer three questions, and we'll let you into our real estate rock star group, or become a real estate rock star group. I apologize. Uh, also, if you want if you're in the group and you're not really sure where to go how to get started what you should be doing first there's a pin post up at the top and if you'll click the pin post even if you're on mobile uh, there's a welcome video and there's a link to a YouTube folder on how I got started I think there's 13 or 14 videos in there right now talking about uh, me how I got started things I learned uh, I cry in some of the videos, I cuss in some of the videos, so be careful, I'm trying not to do that in case you're watching with your kids, but youtube.com slash Whitney Nicely or WhitneyNicely.com slash group, and that'll get you a lot of information about me, and we'll start adding some stuff about Jason shortly. And we do have a little bit of time. Uh... Is there anybody live that has an outstanding question? That anybody uh, watching have a question that you want us to talk about or answer or anything that's going on? Um, a lot of the rock stars are on right now. Y'all don't forget that we're doing speed coaching Thursday afternoons. Uh, you can sign up for a 15 minute block on speed coaching if you're in the group program. Um, and if you're in the one on one, there's a link there to get your one on one call. Uh, I think that's in the pin post in the private student group. Yep. Uh, let's talk about what you're going to talk about tomorrow while they're figuring out their questions. 
So uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about some of the fundamental differences in single family uh, versus multifamily. Uh, and, and basically, there's a lot of definitions you can use, but, you know, most of the time, uh, because lenders kind of look at it this way, if you talk to people, most people will tell you that single family includes um, detached single family residences. Uh, it also includes, uh, for the most part, duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes. Four so, units or less. Uh, four units and less is generally kind of all lumped together as single family. Some people tell you, no, that's not true. Residential. Duplexes are, uh, are multifamily too. And while that is true, lenders don't really look at it that way. Um, and, you know, uh, again, lenders are not my favorite people. Uh, but sometimes, and he's an ex-banker. That, that's true. And, and sometimes um, sometimes it becomes necessary, though, to, to use uh, lenders, especially in certain markets. Uh, you know, when, when interest rates are doing certain things, uh, it actually becomes more attractive to use them than others. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about just some of the fundamental differences, uh, how some of the maintenance cost uh, differ on some of those things, what, how and why property management fees uh, are, are different on multifamily versus single family. And then we're going to get into my favorite. We're going to talk about how they are valued because Whitney loves single family. I love multifamily and, and the valuation is the single biggest reason that I gravitate more to multifamily. I'll explain a little bit uh, of that uh, tomorrow uh, night on the call. Um, and we've got it slated for an hour. Um, I don't think it's going to take us quite an hour to go through all of the slides. So what I'm hoping is, much like this call, I hope we end up with about 15 minutes to spare because I'd love to open it up for people that are on that live to a Q&A uh, where you know we can we can discuss some of the questions and things that, that people have. Again, we, we focused a little bit on this yesterday. We really only intended to send the invitation out to the Rockstars group. Uh, but we had a terrible day on, was it Saturday? Saturday. We had a terrible day. I messed up. It was completely my fault. Uh, and it went out to everybody. So I told Whitney, I said, look, we're, we're not going to retract what we've already said we were going to do. So what we're going to do is we are going to open it up. So anybody that's in the become a, a real estate rock stars group, will get the invite. And I, I guess if they forward it on to somebody that's not, they'll get it too. But, uh, you do have to register for that. And the only reason is I don't want to get you know, people in there, you know, sometimes you get people on webinars and they start taking over comments and stuff and they're doing it just, you know, to be a prankster or whatever. So we don't want to do that. So we are requiring people to register for it. But uh, if you're not a rock star, you have to attend it live because the replay will then only be available to people that are in the exclusive rock stars group. So I, I do want to stress and emphasize that we're going to go through a lot of information. I think some of it for people that are especially starting out is going to be a really eye-opening experience. So if you have time and you want to take advantage of that, please don't miss it. The other thing that we've been talking about, but I am just like about to bust at the seams about is the cheat sheet. <laughs> and we've been talking about the cheat sheet and all of these questions are remarkable. And this cheat sheet is going to be a free guide and it is going to walk through some really, really crucial steps. And then, you know, the, the biggest thing is we can sit here and talk about this stuff till it's blue in the face. And I can tell you, go get leads. What information do I need to get? You need a lead sheet. What if I had a lead sheet that had blanks on it that told me? I have a lead sheet. And what if I could pick that up for next to nothing? How much would that be worth? Uh, you know, so those are some of the things that we want to do. Instead of just talking about stuff, we want to start providing some tools out there. Uh, you know, some of this stuff, you know, is, is going to be free. Uh, some of it, uh, there'll be, you know, avenues uh, for you to actually purchase some of this stuff. You know, some of the stuff we put a lot of time and effort into developing it on our own. And it's not just stuff thrown on a piece of paper. This is stuff that we've developed for our own business and that we know works because we have utilized it over and over and over. For everything that I'll tell you what to do, I probably got 10 or 15 things that I could also tell you what not to do because we've just been there. It's just trial and error. So, okay, one thing, I put, I put the link 
uh, to the Zoom webinar. I put it in the chat here. So you can go pre-register. Uh, one thing Jason said is that if you want the replay, only the rock stars are going to get that. Those are the people in my paid student group. But also uh, next month or next week or whenever we do this again, it will not be available for the big group. This is only for rock stars going forward. Okay. Um, so messed up. Sorry. But you, you, what my mistake is your advantage this time. Uh, so make sure you pre-register for that. Make sure you're there live. If you're not a rock star, if you are a rock star, we'll put the replay up. Uh, and next time it'll only go to the rock stars for the invitation. Uh, and we want to pre-register for that. Okay. I, I told her she screwed it up again. I was booting her out. I was going to take over the group. So we'll, we'll see. See about that now, won't we? <laughs> uh, I think somebody had a question. I have here. one more uh, thing. There's an event in the Become a Real Estate Rockstar. There's, uh, there's the files, there's events, there's videos. There's lots of stuff over on the left-hand side if you're on the desktop. And if you'll go to the event, we make events for things that are coming up. And you can go get the link there also. But I put it in here now, too. Okay, so we do have a question. Laura is in Ohio and she wants to know, so when I own the house on a term lease or for tax purposes, when I sell it, it'll be considered the owner, right? And if you file it, if title goes into your name and you take the proper steps, then yes, you will be selling it as the owner. So as long as you have it for longer than 365 days, you will have long-term capital gains on that, yes. Double check, triple check in Ohio with your attorney or your accountant but as far as I know, yes, that's true. And that's the biggest thing. It does vary state to state. Uh, and Whitney and I have had that happen in the past before. Uh, we actually, do we still? I don't We used to have it in our contract that said that if they cashed out before a year, um, what, what was the exact language? I wasn't listening. We used to have it in the contract that said if you cash oh, out. Oh, there was like a prepayment year, penalty. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, prepayment penalty. And I, is that still in the agreement? It, like if I if I have a lease option on a house and I have it uh, for three, five, ten years, I will tell and say it's my first round on it. Um, so it hasn't boomeranged. It's not the second time it's come back to me. I will tell them that if they cash it out in less than a year, they have to pay an extra, depends on what the property is, but let's say $10,000. And that's a prepayment penalty because I'm going to pay taxes, more taxes on that. And that's just to cover me. And usually you'll find that tenant buyers want more time. They want a year, but they want to tell you, they think it sounds better if they only need six months. Well, I don't want them to do it in six months. I want them to do it in 12 months. So if they do it in 12 months in a day, we waive that pre penalty. But there's also some other ways that we can we can work around it so that if they are dead set and they're going to cash out in three months and they only need three months, then there's some other ways that we can protect ourselves. But we could also just take the tax hit. I mean, if you make 20 grand and you have to give 30 percent of it away, big freaking deal. Just pay your taxes and go on. It's better than getting an orange jumpsuit by trying to slip around. All right. Don't be sneaky. Just pay your taxes. Don't let that stop you from doing a deal. Don't let that stop you from doing a deal. Um, even if you know a lot about, yeah, Karina is right. Even if you know a lot about a uh, single family or multifamily, his presentation by hearing it again, maybe hearing it from a different point of view, you'll get some nuggets and this is free. All right. Skip Big Brother tomorrow night. Is Big Brother on the board? Oh, crap. You scheduled this during Big Brother? Sorry. Record Big Brother tomorrow night and join us. And hopefully by watching us, you'll be in the running for $25,000 or half a million dollars or whatever that grand prize is. Skip the TV, learn how to do real estate. That way when you retire, you can watch all the TV you want to, except by then you'll be so excited and pumped up to do real estate, you won't want to watch TV anyway. All right, we're coming up on top of the hour. Man, we've been talking for a long time. If anybody has any other questions, put it in the event tab for next Wednesday's Ask Wit Wednesday. And if you have any questions in the meantime, you can go ahead and ask me. I'll be around, but we're not. We block out this time, especially every week, to talk to you and get your questions answered and give you lots of content and help you keep going to get a deal done fast. You got anything else you want to say, babe? That's it. Looking forward to tomorrow night. Bye,